Today on Panther TV, she got her running start here at Plymouth South, and now J.C. Andrews is a national collegiate champion. From a steel mill to running the show, we'll introduce you to a local man who changed concert sound as we know it today. And will the Pats win again? We have a very bold prediction from a superfan. I'm a true champion. I'm a champion. Good morning from the South, and welcome to the second annual live broadcast of Panther TV. I'm Sienna Gianelli. And I'm Avery Daly. Many students go on to play sports in college, but very few get to call themselves a national champion. But a former South track star has added that title to her list of accomplishments. Here's Kate Tazowski live with her story. 2015 Plymouth South graduate J.C. Andrews recently returned to talk to spring sports captains about being a leader and how the role her time here at South played in making her a Division III national champion in 60-meter hurdles. J.C. Andrews had athletic experience starting from a young age and was always good at running. So it was in eighth grade when I was, um, I decided to try out for the track team because I've, I've been doing like basketball and soccer previously um, and everyone would com compliment like my speed on the field and on the court so I decided to try out track. From day one she was, it was very clear that she was not the typical high school athlete that we have at Columbus South. She was, she was definitely just a you know, a step faster, a little bit stronger. It was just, it was clear it was going to be fun having her for four years. JC's high school career had a major impact on her and brought her to where she is today. I feel like Mr. Tracy was a, was my biggest supporter here. He always believed in me when I didn't. Um, and also my teammates and my family just keep pushing me and giving me the confidence that I needed. I'd like to say it's impacted her a lot. Um, the thing is, when she was in high school, she was so she was so talented in, in you know pretty much any race that I put her in that she didn't focus on hurdles as much as she has in college. So she's really thrived when she got to college because she's more she's become more of a hurdler. Where in high school it was kind of like, what do I need her to do in this meet today? Because she was so versatile, she could do so many different things. Her hard work paid off as she claimed the Division Three National Indoor Championship title in 60 meter hurdles this spring. She came back to share her experience at the spring captain's breakfast. My season leading up to this was pretty, pretty intense. The training, training got longer, training got harder. Um, and honestly, I, I dreamed of um, accomplishing this, but I never actually thought that I could, um, I could do it. But here I am doing it. <laughs> Mr. Tracy has had many kids continue track at various levels, but this is the furthest one of his athletes has come. I've had kids, you know, go on to college and compete at a pretty high level, but a national champ, I mean, I've, I've never had one before, you know, a former athlete, a national champ, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if I never had one again either. This accomplishment of becoming national champion is very major, and JC's former coach couldn't be more proud. The race was in Boston, so because I actually had the opportunity to, to see her run and see her win the, win the championship, it was, it was like the best, probably the best moment of my coaching career. This is a special accomplishment for me because it's something that um, no matter who comes next in Bridgewater, um, they, this is not something that they can take away from me. Like they can take away all my school records um, and all the accolades, but not this. Congratulations to JC on her national title. We wish her luck in the spring season. Reporting live for Panther TV, I'm Kate Toslowski. JC is one of many Plymouth South athletes to take their skills to the next level by playing college. And with the school year quickly coming to a close, Plymouth South wants to congratulate a departing senior on their commitment to a Division I college sport. For senior Shane Richardson, golf has been a passion of his from a very young age. So I started golf when I was three years old. Uh, my dad uh, played golf since he was like 20. Um, so he just took me out when I was able to hold the club and swing a club. Uh, my first round, I was three years old. Uh, I just fell in love with it right away, and I, uh, I kept playing. Earlier this year, Shane began working with his guidance counselor, Mrs. Cafferty, to explore his options for collegiate golf and found a Division I program at Sacred Heart University in Connecticut. So uh, at the beginning of this year, I started sending out emails to golf coaches. Um, I signed up for this recruiting website. Uh, and then I found Sacred Heart, just local school, and it's a really, uh, really good academic program. Um, so I applied. Last year, Shane was primarily looking at schools based on 
his academic choices. Um, I know he wanted some pretty specific business programs, so he was looking at a lot of schools down south. And I think at the beginning of this year, in the early fall, he realized that golf could be an option for him. So him and his mom really did a great job of reaching out to schools and communicating well with me. So I was able to send transcripts and everything that needed pretty quickly. It was a really fast-paced kind of process um, initially. Email was one tool Shane used, but new recruiting apps also proved to be a helpful way to contact coaches. I saw uh, their program on this uh, recruiting app called NCSA. So I sent the coach an email, um, and then I've been in contact with him for a couple of months, just calls back and forth. Um, and I set up a time to go to Connecticut to meet with him, um, and we just talked. Um, I went to the golf course, met with him, met with some of the players. It took me probably five or six months to finally figure out which school I wanted to go to, um, but in the end it all worked out. Shane was a four-year member and a captain of the Plymouth South golf team, which won the Patriot League title in his junior and senior years. Shane hopes the skills and discipline he's learned here will help him face the responsibilities of college athletics. I think that playing every day here for high school has really helped me. Plus, we play a lot of challenging courses, uh, which I know we will in college, so it's definitely helped me prepare to become a better golfer. It'll be harder, definitely, to deal with the athletics and the academics. Um, but I'm really excited for it. Uh, I know it's a lot more commitment, but I'm really excited to, uh, to see what happens. For any students interested in pursuing athletics along with their college education, Mrs. Cafferty has some advice. Past 10 years I've had students that have been recruited and that will get them only so far. So I think it's really important to keep your grades up. That opens way more doors because athletics is wonderful, but essentially you're really trying to get the best education you can. So you want the athletics to take you as far as possible, but you want to focus on what schools can give you the best education. We wish Shane the best of luck as he plans to major in marketing and sports management while playing golf this fall at Sacred Heart University. Prom is just around the corner, and for many of us, that means time to dress up. A local tuck shop has been giving back to the Plymouth South community for years and helping students look their best for the big night. Here's Pat Ackin with more. Dominic's formal wear is no stranger to Plymouth South. For years, they've been advertising, donating, and giving discounts to students going to big events like next week's prom. Prom is closer than it seems, and by now, most students have rented tuxes for the occasion. For many, this process was made easier because there is a tuck shop in downtown Plymouth that does more for the community than you may know. Dominic's formal wear not only offers discounts to help students afford tuxes, they actually save you a trip by coming into school to do fittings and take orders. For every rental that we do, we like to give back $5 per rental back to the school to help raise some money, and we like to offer a all the students, $50 off to help them uh, afford the tux. Dominic's has been part of the community since the 90s. The local store is always giving back to the schools that support it, including donating to the Mr. Plymouth South show free of charge. It's just to, to help the schools out. I mean, we're, we're a small company, so whatever we can do to help, mm -hmm. and then in return, the school helps us you know, by sending the students our way. The shop doesn't expect anything back from donating to schools. But this does create good publicity for the small store. We, we've been doing this for 27 years, and uh, so far it's working. So um, I, the more I can do, we try to help with uh, the yearbooks and sports. We try to donate as much as we can to, to help the school out. If you're a procrastinator and still need a tux, get down to Dominic's and they might be able to help you out. Reporting live for Panther TV, I'm Pat Eklund. From receiving his nickname Dinky while working in a steel mill to using it to get into famous clubs, Dinky Dawson is known throughout the music industry for working with famous bands and musicians while revolutionizing sound systems for the future. Dinky, who now calls from with home, was the tour manager for Fleetwood Mac and worked alongside many other musicians, from the birds to the new kids on the block. He sat down with me to share his stories and some advice for aspiring artists. He's called Dinky, a nickname he earned for always playing with a small toy car in a steel mill during his younger days. But Dinky Dawson's impact on the world of music has been massive. This group called Fleetwood Mac was wanting a roadie. So I've got my steel degrees. I'm working in a steel mill on shifts, morning, noon, and night, getting good money. Why do I need to go? I wanted to do something different. I went to this muse. It was actually Mick Fleetwood's sister's muse. And I end up there. Mick is actually there. I pick up this van, and in there is a whole bunch of this gear that's absolutely falling apart physically. I says, oh, I can fix this stuff up. Then 
next day or two days later, I have to go back and, and we got our first gig. And that was just the beginning. Dinky Dawson has been called one of the most important figures ever in the development of concert sound for rock bands. For Dinky, music is about more than just instruments and lyrics. It's about the whole experience. It all began with making connections and seeing the joy music can bring. I used the name Dinky. I get in everywhere. It was like, well, okay, that was cool. <laughs> I ended up getting in a nightclub, making friends with the with the, the owner, and I ended up on television dancing on a, on programs like Ready Steady Go in 1965. And that show became one of the top shows that they did on television at that time because everybody was excited. You could see the faces and everybody were having fun, you know. They were all laughing and the real laughing and having having fun. Those are the times that you could do that kind of stuff and get away with it live. Right now, it's all modulated. Dinky not only worked with Fleetwood Mac, he soon developed his own company, Dawson Sound Company, and he spent time working with other famous bands, including The Birds, Jay Giles Band, Steely Dan, Linda Ronstadt, Joni Mitchell, and the New Kids on the Block, in roles ranging from sound engineer to production consultant. These experiences have left him with many stories to tell. Whatever group it was with, there was always some kind of weird event went off in that day. It's not normal. Nothing, there's never anything in anything, any day that we've ever done normal, as you could say is normal day. Was it never. an exciting day though? Everything was a challenge. Everything was exciting. Everything was negative in a lot of ways and positive in others. It was so, whew, a guy called Vance Arnold, you know him as Joe Cocker. Joe Cocker would sing with this feeling, a wonderful feeling. He'd be crying, basically. He sang Georgia on my mind on one show that we did that I, I cried. I could not believe the, the amount of uh, energy and beautiful sound and feeling that this gentleman had put on this song. It was just unbelievable. So those are the things that turn you on at that time period and make you feel good. But all we wanted to do is, is, is get the people that's there in the audience to feel the music, to love the group, to love what's going on, and that's what we were doing in the 60s and the 70s. Dinky experienced just how much fans could fall in love with music on a trip to Finland with Fleetwood Mac. We did one song um, called Albatross that was a, a, a beautiful tune. We got to Finland, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people, worse than the Beatles at Finland. These people, with these kids and everybody, wanted it to, wanted us to, uh, they wanted that song to be their national anthem. It was so wild. Just this beautiful song with two guitars. Wow. And Albatross, they just loved it. They were not just, it was amazing. We'd never experienced, that was the first time I ever experienced vast amount of people waiting at an airport. Much of Dinky's time on the road was during the 70s, a time when peace and love were at the forefront of music. Then, time started to change as drug use grew among concert goers. The energy was so positive all the way through from 70 to 76, 77, 78. 79, it finished. Well, what happened is that the audience was, getting, was dying, physically dying in the place. People were dying left and right in there. There's Why? It was a scene when everything started changing with the audience were getting more anesthetized by bad drugs that was out and, and really bad, especially Florida. The band was trying to play and to give the music and people weren't interested. It was around this time that Dawson came up to New England. We were doing more shows in the colleges around here and New York and all the East Coast than we were playing in California and stuff like that. So why did I want to, I didn't want to live in LA anymore. I wanted to come out of there. After going through some sad scenes in LA, we lost a good friend of mine, Janice Joplin uh, in LA. Janice was so funny. What a voice and what a personality. The personalities were really, really cool people. I was in Stockholm um, at the music, um, at the, the big concert hall with Fleetwood Mac. I just started to finish the, the setup. I'm getting the sound together and, and checking on my system. All of a sudden, I'm bending over. All of a sudden, back on my back. Back. <laughs> Janice. Janice is wonderful. She was just a, a fun, fun girl to be with. Not stupid. Really smart and underneath all that, all, all the other stuff. Aside from the toll the stereotypical rock and roll lifestyle had on many artists, being successful didn't come easy. 
Well, the Beatles were the, a, a band from Liverpool that just went to, to, to Germany. But you see, you work. You work three shows a night. Three shows a night for six nights straight. And then, then they have one day off. And then they keep working. So by the time them guys came back from Germany, they were so tight musicians. They were just amazing. This is what practice and live performances does. It really puts you, and when you play together, it just, it's just magic. Real live music gives you a feeling that no headphone would ever let you receive. For aspiring artists, Dinky says, go with your heart and keep it real. Just start singing the songs that you love. Keep singing, feel yourself, listen to yourself, be yourself, and that's the music. Your heartbeat, the life, the rhythm, the feeling. Just be real and be harmonious, whether you're singing, playing, any instrument, or playing with your fingers, you know? It's just to be real and honest about it. If you're given a song today by a, a, a proper record company, they will tell you how they want you to do it, and then they'll manipulate it with a computer. No, real music, real stuff is from the heart, is from what you do. Listen, all you lot, go out there and play and have fun, whether you want to do it or not, just have fun with it, and it'll come. You think, why do these people in Los Angeles live in these homes that's surrounded by this one environment? They're in their own world. They're in their own environment. Why do you think I call my stuff Dinky's World? Because I'm in my own world. The experiences Dinky has had throughout the years are unforgettable. And if you ever run into him or his wife, Mrs. Dawson, who runs our online classes, they would surely share some of their stories with you. Thanks, Sienna. And now, if music isn't your thing, maybe art is. AP tests are just around the corner, but one area you might forget about when talking about advanced placement courses is art. Amber Lawson is here now to explain just what these classes entail and why students say this opportunity is worth the hard work. Whether it's an interest in ceramics or drawing and printmaking, the art department here at Plymouth South has you covered. The art courses here at Plymouth South may seem fun and in some ways therapeutic, but if you are up for a challenge and looking for ways to spend extra time in the art room, then the AP Art class may be for you. We're excited to have AP Art as part of the curriculum at Plymouth South. We've had AP Art now uh, probably for about seven or eight years. There's been some trial and error to create dynamic portfolios for students, and we really hone the curriculum so that I feel students will have a deep investigation in the arts, the visual arts. When it comes to art, communication is everything. Creativity is in many ways an expressive skill that captures one's imaginative ideas without the actual use of words, some things that Ms. Quinn finds important within the AP art class. AP is an important class. We reach on what's culturally relevant, what's important to students what's personally important and how you communicate that to a, a broader community. I think uh, students have done very well. Every year we do increasingly well. Uh, the students do on their portfolios and the AP exam. Not only does the class entail creativity, but it also calls for discipline when it comes to meeting deadlines on multiple pieces of work at a time. AP art student Paige Cassidy speaks on the struggles that she experiences with this. The biggest challenge is probably timing because I'm always racing to finish everything. It's so difficult to finish everything, but once you get it done, it's really awesome because you can look at your whole portfolio and look at everything you've done it's so cool. Although the idea of an AP art class may be scary, the effort may be worth the trouble considering that you are gaining the experience that you would need at an actual art college. It's similar to a, a foundations, a basic foundations class you would get at most um, art schools and it allows a lot of room for investigation, free time, personal time, working with a group, doing public art as well. So I think it's very helpful to the students to engage. Is it for everyone? Um, I don't think so. I, I think it's for the student who is looking for something different, a different way to communicate. Paige's struggle with time management may be stressful, but it does not take away from the growth she has achieved with Ms. Quinn's support. Ms. Quinn has like really pushed me to like go like past my boundaries, try all this different stuff. Yeah, she's like really pushed me. And I've done stuff in art that I've never thought I would have done, so thanks to her for that. There is a lot to expect when entering an AP level class, 
But besides for the expectations, there is an endless amount of support from others as well. Everyone supports each other. They work together. They share ideas. We peer critique, um, not just a one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. I'm here to support the group, and um, they really rely on each other. They get to know each other and the styles, they experiment, mm -hmm. and they play off of each other too. So it's wonderful to see this group become very independent in developing their portfolios and to see what this really says about themselves. It's exciting. If you're passionate about art or thinking about pursuing art in the future, then the APR class may be for you. If you're interested, you can talk to your guidance counselors. Reporting live for Panther TV, I'm Amber Lawson. The Patriots brought home yet another title to start 2019, and while Gronk has decided it's enough for him, fans want more. One fan who went to the extreme predicting this year's win early says he's expecting the Pats back in the Super Bowl next year. Connor Smith is here live with the story. You may have heard him as young Gronk, though he's not related to the famous brothers. His life still revolves around the Patriots. And last year he made a permanent prediction saying that the Patriots will be bringing home yet another uh, Lombardi trophy to New England. Another February and another victory parade on the streets of Boston, as the Patriots brought home their sixth Super Bowl win since 2001. For most fans, this was a chance to celebrate their team's win, but for some extreme fans, it was a sigh of relief. Uh, you know, it was a little friendly bet with me and my buddy Green Runs Deep. We did a little Instagram. You can't get, if you get 10,000 likes, you gotta get a tattoo. Um, I did all these Instagram videos down in Atlanta last March saying, hey, we're going to be back here for Super Bowl 53. I guarantee you that we're going to win the Super Bowl. And I kept doing this over and over again. And he's like, why don't you get a tattoo? I was a little skeptical, but you know what? Got 10,000 likes, stuck with the word, got the tattoo, and just believed in the team. One month before the season started, the King had a Patriots logo and Super Bowl 53 champs Let's permanently etched in his skin. While some say he got lucky, Brian, also known as the Spike King, says it's all about believing in your team. For him, sports is life, and it's a way to bring people together. Sports is like family. Like, when you go out to Gillette Stadium, you start meeting some of these other diehard fans or just any regular casual fan out there, everyone just comes in together. We all love the same thing. We all come from dif different backgrounds, dif different demographics that sports can bring us together as one. It's a unique topic or something that everyone has a passion for. The Spike King says the future is bright and there's potentially a little more room for a seventh banner and maybe some room on his arm. I mean, it's still going. It's, it's, it's two decades strong so far and we are spoiled in New England to have six banners. Like, I have six banners down here. The fact that we will be back in Miami next year as well. We will be down there for Super Bowl 54. We're just absolutely spoiled. All I can say, baby, you'll see me down in Miami. Super Bowl 54, the Spike King. I got a little room right here for another tattoo at the check back in August. And we'll add another banner back here as well. You have known every single day that I believed in the New England Patriots. And guess what? The tattoo came true and we're able to do this. Super Bowl 53 champions, New England Patriots. And let me tell you something out there. I think we have enough room for a seventh banner down here at the HQ. Let's go! The Spiking hopes the Patriots continue their success and continue to ride the wave. Reporting live for Panther TV, I'm Connor Smith. And that's our time for today. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day from the South.